Hey, thank you, Juliana. Um, so as promised in the program, this is going to be an open source love story in three acts. And like all good uh, three act plays, it starts with a dramatis personae, uh, us explaining the characters. So first of all, this is Peppercorn. Uh, Peppercorn is one of your user's dogs. Um, like a good dog owner, upon getting Peppercorn, your user immediately changed all of their passwords on all of their services to Peppercorn. So Peppercorn will be coming back. This is Mallory. Mallory is an attacker. She is attempting to compromise your system. Uh, and this is me. Uh, my name is TJ Shook. I uh, am on the internet everywhere, most notably GitHub and Twitter, as at TJ Shook, my name without the dots and spaces. Uh, I work at a company called Harvest as a developer. We make the world's best time tracking software. If you charge money for your time or do any client work or just want to know where your time is going, you owe it to yourself to check us out. Um, and notably, I am not a security expert. There are real security experts in the world that get paid a lot of money to be very good at security stuff. If you have security problems, you should hire them. However, ignorance is not an excuse, and we are all security experts by virtue of having users. Um, if there was a security breach, your excuse cannot be, I don't know anything about that. That won't go over well. You need to have at least a modicum of knowledge, or else you are the kind of uh, weak link in the chain. So back to Mallory. Um, her attack is going to be a, a simple one, because good security is about layers. You should have application level security that protects against things like you know, SQL injection or XSS or CSRF and all that. Uh, you should have infrastructure level security like a secure data center and firewalls between all of your devices. However, to kind of analyze any part of the layer cake, you have to almost assume that all the other ones have failed. So we have to assume that Mallory can just do this. She just does this and gets a database dump from your service. Um, she shouldn't be able to do that, but for the sake of analyzing this part of your security, you should assume that she can. So what could she get if you were storing you know, passwords for your users, which you generally have to do if you have any kind of auth? The easiest way to store that would just be plain text. Just don't even care. Um, you, know, you just have your users table, you have their email addresses, and when they put in a password, you just store it. This is bad for obvious reasons. Um, no one here is doing this, right? Right? All right. So it doesn't matter, because even when I say right twice, someone's like, no, but I can totally do it. I have good reasons. And their good reasons are usually something like, oh, I want to be able to send my users their password when they forget it. Nope, bad reason. Do a password reset flow. It's easy. Um, the other one is like, oh, my site doesn't matter. You know, it's a, it's a GIF rating site. And if someone steals my passwords, they can just log in and rate GIFs for everyone. Um, that doesn't work because that's not how the world works and users use passwords the same on all of their services like Peppercorn's user. So when they break in and they get Peppercorn from this uh, table, they're not going to go rate a bunch of gifts for Peppercorn's owner. They are going to try to log into Gmail with it and try to log into banking sites with it and try to log into everything with it and they will get way more hits than you'd expect because people are terrible at passwords. So what do we do? Um, we need some way to obfuscate the dump so that we don't just have plain text passwords. So we encrypt them. This is uh, ROT13, wrote 13, a Caesar cipher with a key of 13. You take all the letters and you shift them by 13. So A becomes N, B becomes O, C becomes P. Um, you wouldn't do that, right? Um, but you could do something more complicated and secure. You could do like AES256 or DES3 or any kind of encryption. But the notable thing about all of those is that they are two-way. Um, there is a secret. In this case, the secret is 13. But for like DES or AES, you have an actual secret key that can decrypt it. Encryption is reversible. That's the key there. Um, anyone with that secret can unencrypt it. Uh, since Mallory already has gotten into your system to get that database dump, we can also assume she could do things like get your secret keys if they're an app code or just stored on the server. On top of that, the attacker could be an employee. You could have a ma malicious employee that is in your app code all the time and knows how you do things. And then they could dump the database to their local computer and go to town. Um, so what you want is something like hashing. Hashing is irreversible. It is one way. So if you have the string peppercorn and you hash it, you get output. And if you take the string secret1234 and hash it, you get output. But if you have output, there's no way to tell what gave that output. So just by having that, it doesn't help us at all. So that's a good thing. It's irreversible. So when they get that database dump, they can't just like 
do the opposite to get back. Um, the other nice thing is that hashing is deterministic. So when you put in peppercorn, you get something out. When you put in peppercorn, you get the same thing out. When you put in peppercorn, you get the same thing out. That's how you can use it to power your passwords. When someone logs in, they, you hash it on the server to see if it matches the hash that you previously calculated. If the two hashes match, the passwords match because hashing is also unique in addition to being deterministic. For a definition of unique, there are collisions. We can talk about that later, but not important. Just assume that they're unique and they're deterministic. Additionally, and this is very important, it's deterministic but not obvious. So though you have peppercorn, you hash it twice and you get it again, if you change it by just like capitalizing it, the output is completely different. It's not like it changes by one bit just like you changed it. Um, additionally, if you have output that's different by one bit, so the least significant bit is off by one here, you still have no way of knowing if it's at all similar to pep peppercorn. That's deterministic, not obviously deterministic. So that's good. So we can use that now. So, uh, and I am using MD5 as the hashing algorithm here, not something else just because it's the shortest one and it fits on slides best. Uh, but SHA-1 and other ones are effectively the same thing, so it all applies. Um, we can't go backwards, and we know that, and all of these are unique to the password, so we're good, we're safe. Um, but there's a problem. The fact that hashing is deterministic is a double-edged sword. Because passwords, when they get hashed, are always the same, when passwords get hashed, they are always the same. So because Peppercorn is always going to hash to this same thing, it introduces this terrible concept of rainbow tables. Um, to save time in the Q&A, yes, this is the best slide that's ever been made. Um, <laughs> however, uh, it's a goofy name, and no one really uses it seriously anymore. Most people just say look up tables, but um, yeah, because everyone, whenever they say it, makes a joke like this. So. As a proof of concept, like we have this table and we can work backwards using a lookup table. So someone just takes a big list of words and they hash them all and now they have all the outputs. So now they just look up that hash to go backwards. And the world's best lookup table is Google. So you can do this yourself, like just fire up a console and hash something. You can type in the hash and then you search and then you don't even have to leave the results page. It will just tell you what that hash is over and over again. Um, so we need some way to defeat the rainbow. And the best way to do that is to change all of the inputs in some way that makes them unlikely to be in this table. Oh, I hit the wrong button. There we go. Okay, so we know that peppercorn always goes in one way and comes out the other way. But if we just append some nonsense to it, and we know that always append the same nonsense to it, now we have a string that is very unlikely to be in one of these tables, because why would anyone put that string in? It's nonsense. And we can prove that that works. Hey, look, our rainbow table does not have anything that matches this. No one has ever hashed this and put it into a table before. We have defeated everyone. We have won. We did it. Let's, come on, guys. We did it. Passwords are done. An attacker is no longer able to look up those hashes in a table, and that's great, except we didn't do it. Um, they can't look them up in a table, but they can just make a new table. So if they know that scheme that they've already been given, they can just kind of do that to their word list and trivially regenerate it. On this MacBook Air, which is you know a huge powerhouse of machine, I can do 13 million SHA-1s in one second. So regenerating a table is kind of trivial. As a proof of concept, this is where Harvest was. We had that one kind of globally generated string that we just appended to all of them, and Shaw won it. Um, I took a dump of our hashes. I did our best to anonymize the data. So I just had the hashes, and then I ran them through a freely available program on the internet. Uh, I used Hashcat. There's also John the Ripper. John the Ripper, which you can install via Homebrew. It's not that hard to do. Um, and then I got a 25 million word list uh, that I got from the internet in about 10 minutes. And uh, there, right in the middle, was Peppercorn, along with 87,000 other passwords. It was not that hard to come by all of these. It took me uh, a minute and a half. These passwords were also in there. So these programs and these word lists are better than you think they are and hope they are. They have things like alternates, like that universe at the top. They have things like that one in the middle that looks secure, but if you look at a QWERTY keyboard, it's just a pattern on the keyboard. So they're smart enough to know that. That last one, I don't even know why that's in there. But it seems strong, but you would be wrong. It could be cracked because it's in a word list somewhere. So that brings us to actual salting. So before we just appended the same thing in our auth flow over and over again, now we can individually salt them, and we effectively give every single user a secure password. Um, now in the table next to it, we store it along. It doesn't actually matter that the attacker knows the salt. It doesn't help them too much. 
Um, but now we get actual unique passwords. And if we have very random salts, there's enough entropy that even users with matching passwords won't collide in the table. So you don't know how many people all have the same password or something like that. And this is actually pretty good. We are getting pretty good. This is nearly state of the art in 1976. Um, <laughs> this is what Crypt3, the utility in Unix, did in 1976. Uh, at the time, it could do four of these a second. Uh, a modern computer could. So it was pretty resistant to attacks. But we have these. This is an AMD AX7990. Costs less than a thousand bucks. So anyone that wants one can get one. And it will do 1.5 billion hashes a second. So that makes generating these lookup tables for every individual user, again, trivial. And you're kind of back into the same problem. The problem here, though, is that all of these hashing algorithms are designed to be fast. They are not supposed to be used for password security. They are used for file fidelity. You're supposed to put them at like both ends of a network transfer. If the input's hashed on one end and hashed on the other end, if the hashes match, the file is the same. So it wasn't like, you know, corrupted in transit. We need something that's designed intentionally to be slow for passwords. So in 1999, Niels Provost and David Mazzieri's actual security professors for the OpenBSD project wrote a uh, paper called Future Adaptable Password Schemes, and they came up with Bcrypt. Bcrypt is, you know, it's got all of the goodies that we've previously talked about. So it's a one-way hash. Awesome. It's pre-image resistant. Great. It's deterministic. Awesome. So it does everything we need. The, the per-password salts are built in. You don't even have to worry about doing them. They're there by default. But it has two additional things that make it even better. One, the cipher that powers it, xBlowfish. Um, it's based on Blowfish, which is a cipher that is notoriously expensive to set up. xBlowfish stands for expensive key schedule Blowfish. It's even more expensive. So just to boot into the cipher to start doing the hashing takes a long time. And also, it is memory intensive, which is what rules out GPUs. GPUs are built to just do a lot of operations really fast, but they usually have very low memory ability and available. So this kind of makes them unable to do it. The other thing that's more important is it has what's called an adaptive cost. So let's go back to our dump and look at this uh, bcrypt digest. And let's analyze the anatomy of it. So at the end here is the actual hash. This is the checksum that comes out. Um, right to the left of it is the salt that goes in. That's the built-in salts we were talking about. Uh, the dollar signs are just delimiters. You can ignore them. This far left thing, 2A, is just an identifier. It means this is a bcrypt digest. That's how you, if you have multiple digests in a system, you can tell which one is which. But this one right here, that is the cost. And that's the interesting part here. So. If you take something like Peppercorn and bcrypt it and bcrypt it and bcrypt it with different costs, you'll still get the quote unquote same output. They're different because they're individually salted, remember. But what's notable about them is, see this one has the higher cost, how long it takes to generate each one. So the first two take 0.06 seconds on this MacBook Air, and the last one takes over a second. So what we can do is knowing this, and this is uh, the average cost on my computer for hashing a bunch of things, is work our way upwards over time. So now if we're using like a cost of 12, because we can, know, we can do like four of them a second, as computer hardware gets faster, we can keep up with it by increasing the cost over time. So that's a good way to do that. And that's kind of the sweet spot. So that attack previously that I did in 87 seconds on this computer would now take 84,000 years on this computer right now. And though that's a long time, hardware marches forward. So it might get down to 50,000 years at some point. But that's still pretty good. Um, yeah. Now, at this point, some of you are saying, well, instead, you should use PBKDF2, or you should use script, or any other thing that kind of alleges to do the same thing. And that's great. You guys are further ahead than most. So cool. If you want to have that debate, we can have it. I still think you're wrong, but they're good. Um, so those are good alternatives if you have them. So the fix is pretty simple. Um, you need a plain text version coming in because you can't calculate a hash without it. If you already have the plain text or two-way encrypted, you can just go ahead and do it on your own. It's great. But if you don't, you can just uh, loop into your current authentication where you have your old hashing method password in and you check it. And you want to get to here using bcrypt to do it. You can just kind of have a pre-filter that converts on the way. And that pre-filter, bcrypt, the Ruby gem has built into it this valid hash method where you can check and say, oh, is it already bcrypted? If so, jump back. We're good. If not, just convert it in line, update the record, and then carry on. 
Uh, and that's what we did at Harvest. And this is, over time, our number of users that had bcrypted passwords. You can see there was a big jump at the beginning, as everyone auth the first time. And then it slowly leveled off. And that got us through most of our active users, but not all of them, because some people are using OAuth. Some people have very long-lived sessions. So I just white hat attacked our database a second time, but this time converted in line. And that got us most of the way there for the rest of them. Um, this actually got most of our active users a fair number of inactive users. And then the remaining ones, we just reset and sent them an email. And that was good. Um, there is one bad thing about Bcrypt, and that is, since it is an expensive algorithm, it is also an expensive algorithm. So this is our CPU usage when we launched it. Uh, and it doubled uh, from roughly, let's see, 12.5% to 25% across all of our servers. Uh, that's still within the realm of being tolerable. So you should not be that concerned about it. Um, so uh, the first act in a good play is about uh, exposition. So the second act is usually where you add the, the conflict. So this is about fat binary gems, and it kind of goes to what Raphael was saying about libxml. Um, Fat binary gems are how you can support multiple versions of Ruby in a gem that has binaries uh, on multiple platforms like Windows. Bcrypt Ruby is the Ruby gem that allows you to do Bcrypt stuff. Um, so I wanted to add a feature to the library, but I'm sorry, I wanted to add a feature to the library, but when I tried to, the test didn't run, the dependencies were out of date, there were missing docs. So for the one feature I wanted to add, I opened up 10 different pull requests. And uh, that's the good way to be kind of the pestering younger brother and eventually just get commit bit. So uh, I was then added as a maintainer of Bcrypt Ruby. And I kind of became the de facto maintainer of Bcrypt Ruby because all of the previous ones didn't really have any need for it or weren't keeping up with it. Some of them didn't even write Ruby anymore. Um, so this is what the Bcrypt Ruby source looks like. But more importantly, this is. Uh, it is a wrapper around a C extension and a Java extension. And because of that, for your users, you have to provide compiled binaries. Um, so in every version, there are four different versions that you distribute. So in the first two, those are both Windows fat binaries. Uh, they're for 64-bit and 32-bit, uh, respectively. Um, so to do that, there is, thank, I'm not a Windows developer, there is a library called MinGW that uh, allows you to, on Nix-like systems, compile Windows binaries. Great. Uh, thankfully, when Amon added the feature to do this, he left great directions in the commit. But that commit is three years old, so none of those directions worked. Um, Aaron Patterson kind of made the same joke that I did like three years before I did um, in the subject of his post, uh, kind of laid out how to do this as well. But again, because this was three years old, it also didn't work. Um, all of these are wrappers for rake compiler, which is a gem that is used to kind of compile these binaries into your gems. Uh, and I went through all the docs for that, trying to do, again, the same thing. And as you'd expect, that also didn't work. So um, the Rails project has this thing called the Rails dev box. And it's a virtual machine for Ruby on Rails core development, as it says right there. And what it does is it gives the ability for you to run the Rails tests if you don't have every single dependency set up on your machine, like all the database adapters and memcache and everything. And so in the box, it just packages up all of these uh, you know, native dependencies so you can run the tests. And I had this dream, this great dream, that I wanted to make a rate compiler dev box that had all the rubies you needed, GCC, the JDK, MingGW, and you would be able to kind of do the same thing. Uh, and that's vagrant. It's, it promises us development environments made easy. Like, you can do exactly what I'm trying to do. So this is awesome. So I go through and I follow the docs. I'm like, I'm going to make this box. It's going to be great. And that, of course, also doesn't work. Um, <laughs> So I did what you do with every great project that doesn't work, and I put it on GitHub. Um, so <laughs> with it on GitHub, and now in our three-act play is where we hit the climax, I opened up break compiler issue number 79. Uh, this is the issue where I said, listen, man, I've tried all of the docs like 100 different times in 100 different ways, and nothing works. So what do I do? And you were promised a love story. And this is Luis Lavena. Luis uh, developed the one-click Ruby installer for Windows, so if you do any Ruby development on a Windows machine, you owe him a beer. Uh, he also is on Ruby Core uh, as part of his work with the one-click Ruby installer. 
Uh, he was a Ruby hero in 2010. Uh, most notably of all, he is a South American. But second most notably of all, he is the developer of Rake Compiler. Um, he is also one of the best maintainers on Earth. And so immediately, he opened up Rake Compiler DevBox issue number two, where he opened up this thing to fix all those problems I was having and dropped on me triple hearts. Not once, not twice, <laughs> not three times, but four different times. <laughs> so now you all get to become privy to my giant scam, which is touring the world giving a talk to pay him back. So I'd like you to all take out your internet devices and go to Twitter and tweet three hearts at Luis Lavena because I am indebted by 12 emoji hearts, so I need to pay him back. Um, thank him for being a wonderful maintainer and OSS contributor. But more so, uh, though this is my scam, I would encourage you to find your own scam and find your own Luis. And it could be an open source contributor. It can be a coworker whose work you admire. Um, and thank them. But more importantly, because thanking them is easy, collaborate with them. A lot of them are busy and have day jobs. And you know, Luis expressed his own gratitude in the thing for building the box, even though I didn't make one that worked. But uh, you know, they, they have things that they need to do too. And anything that you can do to help them is a great thing. So from that, what have we learned? Number one, just use bcrypt. Just do it. End of story. Um, if you need any help, we can talk about it. Number two, distribute a dev box. If you have anything with like complicated dependencies or anything like that, make a Vagrant box so other people can build it, like the Rails team did, like Ray Compiler now has. It doesn't have to be for your own project. If you have problems setting up something somewhere else, you can do that. Um, and then lastly, and most importantly, just release, collaborate, and iterate. And together, we'll make the world a better place. Uh, thank you. My name is TJ Kirkian. I work at Harvest. And we have time for some questions. Yep, microphone is coming. Peppercorn was drawn by my boss, by the way, so. Awesome talk. Um, the CPU graph you showed, was that across like, for the entire app or just for the requests that used? It was across all of our servers for the entire app. Um, so the biggest problem with that is we because we are old enough that we did not have OAuth 2 from the get-go, we still support basic auth from our mm -hmm. API. And anything that does like polling against Harvest, which is kind of common to get time data, it, uh, it has to do a password auth on every single request. So that kind of artificially jumps it up a bit. But as more and more get on OAuth, and additionally, in that conversion flow, it's kind of doing two bcrypt auths. So that didn't help either. So that was probably a bad case of it being worst case scenario, and it still wasn't even that bad. Uh, we could have dialed down the cost if it was too bad, but yeah, that was everything everywhere. Yep. And another question. Um, I, I know absolutely nothing about any of this, but okay. I've been using <laughs> I've, I've been using uh, BBK uh, DF2. Yeah. Really? Why do you say bcrypt is superior? The biggest thing is the uh, the memory cost. Um, that can scale with CPU speed pretty uh, well and linearly. So it, it, is, it is resistant because it has many, many iterations as well. And you can also increase that over time to get more of them. Uh, but I think the, the ability to trump dedicated hardware is where bcrypt kind of shines in that regard. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? No one want to troll me about SRP, the alternative protocol for all thing? <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everyone.